Bug, on their laptop. 2016, and the in, January. And he basically proceeded to hijack everybody's laptop because by default, you have IPv6 enabled, which on Vista and later, and I think OS 10.3, <coughs> it's on by default, and it's preferred by default. So if you don't have a lockdown, somebody can basically just hijack your session. So that kind of got my attention. I thought that was pretty cool. And, uh, you know, and then it went from there. So um, if we look at IPv6, it, it definitely has been slow going. So it, it, IPv6 actually this year turned 20 years old. So the, it's been out for quite a while. Um, the uptick has not been that fast. We'll kind of talk about why that is, what's going on. And um, I tried to spend some time thinking about just this opening slide kind of trying to set the tone. If we look at IPv4, um, IPv4 has really turned into a walled garden. So for a long time, people were afraid of what's called CGN, and we'll talk about that. And really, CGN is just the norm nowadays. So if you look at most of the carriers, or most of the internet service providers, <coughs> CGN is standard. And uh, CGN, I mean, it's, um, it is what it is, but it does end up kind of turning into a walled garden because it, it causes a lot of problems if you want to have direct communication, so especially for things like voice and video. And uh, it also makes it really hard to do novel things. So, you know, walled gardens can be really beautiful, right? But it, it kind of tends to restrict you to what you know and what you're comfortable with. Um, whereas if we look at IPv6, it, it's a little bit of the uh, <coughs> explored the future. And so there's a lot of cool things, but it's also it's kind of the unknown. So I, I think part of the issue is, you know, it's new, it's uncomfortable. I mean, people have done IP for 20 years, and it is a big change. Yeah. CGN stands for? CGN stands for Carrier Grade NAT. So um, I, I will get into that. And it's, the Carrier Grade NAT basically means I have multiple cascading layers of NAT. And it, it's an address conservation technique. <coughs> so it's a good question. And I will, I promise, like with all the terminology, I'll, I'll go through that. <coughs> all right. So um, there's, there's two things I want to talk about. Uh, try and I think this roughly split down the middle. So the first is kind of where are we at in the industry, right? So I know it kind of runs the gamut. Uh, there's some companies that have already fully deployed IPv6 and they're done, right? That's a pretty small minority, but, but there are some, um, even in the area, you know, especially if you look at an armor. Um, most companies, though, have it. Some are dabbling. So I, I don't make any assumptions and I try and kind of look at, you know, when is it interesting for you? And I, I guess at the end of this talk, I hope I'll at least give you enough so you can decide, you know, yeah, this is interesting for me or it's not interesting yet. Because really, I mean, you have to decide yourself. I mean, it's, it's going to be different for everybody. And the second thing is, um, actually I checked, this is actually the fourth year I've done this. So if you go back and look at the MUG website, there's a lot of history. Um, and with IPv6, I mean, uh, I mean, if you think about, think about network. Right? If you think about what networking touches, I mean, it touches everything. So, you know, in an hour, hour and a half talk, you know, you can only do so much. So I, I do kind of dive into some areas, like um, I spent, spent some time on the Socket API, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, but I can't talk about everything. So a lot of the stuff with the basics, with commands, with troubleshooting, if you go back and look at the you know, past three Januaries, the slides are there, and I would encourage you to, to look there if you're curious for more details. You know, if I could interrupt just for a second. Sure. One thing we forgot to mention during the, uh, the opening uh, stuff. We have refreshments over here. If you guys want a cookie or, and a pop, uh, the idea is to put a dollar in the jar, and you can take a cookie and a pop or uh, two cookies. And feel free to get up. If you can do it quietly, you can get up any time during, during the presentation. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. That was important. <laughs> Some people were. Okay. Um, so let me let me start with uh, like I said. I try not to assume anything. Um, you know, there's a lot of background, but let me try and cover some of the basics. So in terms of how does IP addressing work, right? So so somebody has to be in charge of it. So the, the organization in charge of really internet governance is called ICANN or the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and they basically internet governance, including things like DNS and addressing. And they have an arm under them called IANA, which is the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, and they basically deal with addressing. So they deal with all of IPv4 and IPv6. And IANA will basically <coughs> delegate blocks of addresses to the regional internet <coughs> So if we look at the world, the world
world is carved into five regions. Each region has a representative RIR that's in charge of address space for that area. So for, so for us, that's Aaron. Um, Aaron does uh, the US, Canada, and a little bit of the Caribbean. And uh, those registries, if I need an address block, that's where I apply, right? I, 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 somebody, an end user, an ISP wouldn't go to IANA, they would go to their appropriate registry. Um, now, from a registry's point of view, there are two types of users. You can either be an LIR, which, which is essentially an internet service provider, or you can be an end user. Now, for IPv4, that didn't matter, and I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but for IPv6, it's important, and actually the addresses are different depending on which type you are. So an ISP or an LIR basically means when I get an address block, most of those addresses I'm not going to use for myself. I'm going to delegate them to customers, right? So I'm going to use those addresses and I'm going to delegate it to other companies, other people, other users. Whereas an end user, if I get my address block, I'm just going to use it for my, myself. I'm not going to give it to partners or other people. And uh, you, you get a different block depending on which one you do. Now, why that matters, and especially for IPv6 is, with IPv4, um, if you've been in the industry since the you know, early to mid 90s, before NAT became really popular, People used to actually use public, and there's actually still a few companies that do, use public addresses for everything, as opposed to just their internet presence. Um, since we don't have enough addresses in IPv4, you know, in the last 10 years, it's kind of gotten to the point where everybody uses private addressing internally and public addressing just on the edge. But one of the ideas with IPv6 is to kind of get back to, I have public addressing for everything. Um, and, and there are some reasons for that. Basically, the, the biggest reason is it makes communication a lot easier, right? So imagine when I'm calling somebody, if I have to call you and you're behind a PBX, I mean, it's not hard. I just call the PBX, I hit in your extension, and then I talk to you. But, but it's still, you know, if I want to audit, it's still a little bit of work, right? It's an extra step. It's nice if I can just call you direct, right? So most people you'll find that have phones, they'd rather have their own phone number than have an extension. And that's the idea with IPv6. Now, rather than having to go through a gateway, I can just talk to you natively. Now, the challenge with that is, if I get my address block from my ISP, then if I change ISPs, I have to renumber. Now, if I just have to renumber my internet presence, that may not be too bad. But if I have 10,000 nodes and I have to readdress all of them, that's a pain, right? So that's why with IPv6, end user addressing gets more interesting. Okay, now, with, uh, with IPv4, um, if we look at an IPv4 address, you know, we, we have four octets, right? So 10.1.2.220, for example. And each one of those octets is eight bits. And the reason I mention that is when you, when you look at um, people like ICANN and the registries and anybody who deals with addressing, they're gonna talk in what's called CIDR notation. So that's what this slash eight is. So a slash eight means we're talking about the first eight bits or the first octet. So if I look at IPv4, each number can be 0 to 255 or 256 possibilities. So that means with IPv4, I have a theory, a theoretical possibility of 256 of those slash gates, right? Which is roughly 4.3 billion addresses. So that's my total. Now out of that, I can only use about 221 of those. And that's because if you think about it, right, I can't use zero, I can't use 127, I can't use private addressing including 10, I can't use multicat, uh, multicat and my traditional class E block, which is uh, two, uh, 240 to 255, none of those I can use, right? So if I take all that out and a few more, <coughs> I'm left with 220.8 usable blocks, which is about 3.7 billion. So it sounds like a lot. However, if we look at, remember, so IANA delegates blocks to the RIRs, the IRRs then turn around and delegate them to end users or ISPs. If I look at all five RIRs, I have 3.64 slash eights left, which is about 60 million addresses, um, which is a problem, it's not enough. So that means that I've allocated a little over 217 of those blocks have been basically given out to people, to companies, to organizations. And out of those, 168 are advertised. So advertised means if I look in BGP on the internet, so, so BGP is the routing protocol that I use to route traffic on the internet. If I look, 
I will see 168 of those blocks advertised. So not all of them, but most of them. So ju just to give you some background. <coughs> now, um, one thing, when I did this talk last year, um, I think I kind of got the impression for a lot of people, when we talk about IPv6 and we talk about, you know, the internet's oversubscribed, there's too many people, we have IoT, and blah, 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 blah. I think it's a lot of people here. They're like, ah, you know, come on, there's really, there's plenty of addresses, it's not a problem, you're making it up, right? You know, so-and-so gave back their slash aid, we'd be fine. So I, I wanted to take just a little bit to, to give you some background about why is IPv4 a problem? Why, why have we gone through all these addresses? So if we look at the population, we're a little over 7 billion. And out of those 7 billion people, um, 43 or 44% of them are online. So if everybody on the world is online at the same time, right, it's obvious this doesn't happen, but if it did, you can see we already have a problem, right? Because that's just users. That's not counting servers and infrastructures and routers and firewalls and all the other stuff we need to make the internet work. Right, so if you start kind of thinking about how many people are using the internet, you can see it's, it's getting pretty crowded. Um, in addition, we also have the, the mobile space, right? So now, with the mobile numbers, it depends on where you look. So I looked at the GSM Association, and they basically said if you look at all 3G connections, there are right now about 7.6 billion. Now, not all of those are IP-based yet, but, but it's going that way really <coughs> fast. Pretty much I can tell you from working at one of the largest carriers in the world, everything is going IP. Everything else is going away, right? If you look, the, the goal with all the major carriers in the U.S. is to totally eliminate POTS, like your, your legacy phone lines, by 2020. Like, it's gone. And Europe has the same goal. No more, no more analog, everything is IP-based. So this, this is where the world is going. So again, that, that's a challenge too, right? So if we have 7.6 billion already, how do we make that work in an addressing system only designed for 4 billion? Then we also have what's called the internet, <coughs> and you've seen this, this M2M. So M to M is machine to machine, right? So for example, let's say I have a vending machine, and I want that vending machine to tell me if it's out of coke. Well, I can put a sensor in it, and I can say, hey, if you sense that the coke's out, you know, shoot a message to the data center, and so I can dispatch somebody to fill it back up. So there's a lot of things like this going on. That's that the M to M or the IoT the Internet of Things category. And there's more and more of these things cropping up. So right now, there's about 5 billion of those sensor-type devices online. And the most conservative estimate is from Gartner. They said that's going to be 25 billion in the next five years. Some people think 50, 100, or even 200 billion, which, which may sound kind of fantastic, but we'll come back to that in a minute. But again, so you have all of these things trying to get online. So, so that, that's what's creating a bit of a challenge. Now, um, in terms of, I think when most people think of networking, we still tend to think of this guy, right? When I talk about a network, I think about my laptop, Maybe I think about my smartphone, but you know, I, I kind of think of things that I'm holding, right? But I believe um, last year, the number of M2M uh, -M devices, or devices basically that don't interact with people, they only interact with other machines, the number of those devices passed the number of human use devices. And it's going to grow by orders of magnitude over the next five, ten years. In fact, Stanford, I didn't show it here because I think it's, it's almost too mind-blowing, but Stanford thinks that in the next ten years, we're going to have over a trillion of these things online. <laughs> so not, not everybody agrees with that, but I mean, the, the number is going to be massive. So if we look at, this is microcontrollers, right? So this, this is an integrated circuit um, analyst firm, and they look at microcontroller shipments. Now, not all microcontrollers are networked. So, my, so if I have a sensor and actuator, right? So let's say I'm building, uh, I'm building an autonomous vehicle. I have to have sensors on the car, and I have to have actuators to make things happen, right? Or, or anything. So all these sensors and actuators are usually uh, run by a microcontroller. And these microcontroller assemblies, we sell billions of them every year. But they're not all networked yet. So what's changing is, in the next five years, the cost for me to include networking componentry on this integrated circuit, the cost is going way down. And Gartner says that by 2020, it's going to be less than a dollar a unit. So it'll be so cheap 
to give you network connectivity for cellular or Ethernet or wireless or whatever, then it'll just be a given. Because it's going to be so cheap, it'll be on everything. So not necessarily everything will have the network, <coughs> but it will have the capability. And if we look at this category, we have tens of billions of new devices every year. So by 2020, if all of these devices are going online, and this kind of shows the net new, that's where people are getting that 200 billion number, right? So if, if we keep throwing all this stuff online, that's, this is what's causing this strain with IPv4. Now, um, I don't want to go through this too much because, because of time, but just to give you a quick idea, I mean, this is how this is being used today. And I, I can actually tell you right now, I am working with a utility, and basically all of their stuff is all online, right? And one of their concerns is security. But everything's online. I mean, the, the days of analog cages and, and like having people watch something, those days are long gone, right? Everything's automated. So if I'm dealing with you know, power, if I'm dealing with water, wastewater, gas lines, um, fleets of trucks or cars, all of those things have sensors, they report back to a central monitoring station and everything's automated, right? And we only want to get a person involved if something interesting happens, right? If something bad happens, if there's a problem, we need a person. But we don't want, we don't want somebody you know, just kind of staring at a bunch of gauges that are good. So, so, so all of these industries are exploiting this to basically automate more and more services. Now, um, going back to that 3.64 number, <coughs> this is how we get that. So like I said, IANA is totally out of IPv4 addresses. And if we look at the registries, so APNIC serves Asia Pacific, uh, RIPE ser serves uh, Europe and the Middle East, and LACNIC serves Latin America. Now, these three RIRs are what's called depleted. So depleted means they're not completely out, but they're in a rationing mode. So APNIC, what happens is they were burning through addresses really fast, and one thing, once they got down to one slash eight, is it okay? Everybody in our region now only gets a thousand addresses one time for the rest of eternity, and that's it. Because they have to do that, otherwise all the addresses would be gone. So that, that's how they survive and they don't completely run out. So that's why you'll see that these guys are going really slow because they're rationing their addresses to try and prevent complete run out. Aaron, did, Aaron is uh, our registry and they decided we're not gonna have any reserve. So in September they just totally ran out and they're at zero. <laughs> and Afrinic is the only registry that has any addresses left. They enter rationing mode when they get down to one slash eight, which should be mid next year. So that's it. Now, um, one common thing that I still see a lot of is, um, I, still, I still see a lot of people or hear a lot of people that will say, so-and-so company has a slash eight, or so-and-so university has a slash eight, and if that university would give that slash eight back, we would need IPv6 and we'd be fine, right? And you know, I mean, I can see that because a slash eight, I mean, that's almost 17 million addresses. I mean, that sounds like a lot, right? So the question is, how long, if somebody gave a few slash eights back, how long would it last? So you can actually go to podaroo.net. That site is run by Jeff Houston. He's the chief scientist for Apnic Labs, and he publishes all the data. So if you're interested in internet data, I mean, that's a treasure trove. And here, he's published um, up to 2011. So 2011 is when IANA ran out, and then the numbers are skewed because there's not enough supply. But you can see that in 2011, when we ran out of addresses in February, we still went through one slash eight a month, right? Now this is five years ago. The internet's been steadily growing since. In fact, with IoT, it's accelerating. So five years ago, we'd go through one slash eight a month. So even if we got like five slash eights back, I mean, really, it'd, it'd give us another three months, right? So it's important when, when you're looking at, you know, what you're going to do or how things are going to work. You want to look at what are the numbers and how fast do things last, or how long do things last, how fast do we burn through things? Because one slash eight, I mean, you're talking, you know, two or three weeks, really, it, it, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter, right? So, so keep that in mind when you're formulating your policy. Now, um, I also took this data and I built a chart to, to try and give some context. So this, this red line on the bottom here, this is the address supply. So, um, in, in terms of growth, the average growth on the internet, not, not counting for IoT, so we're going to conveniently ignore that, right, even though it's the biggest category, 
growth has been about 6% a year. So if we say, okay, you know, let's ignore IoT, and we're just going to say that 6% growth continues, and that's what this is here. This would be the demand for addresses, right? So between two and 300 million net new addresses per year that IANA would need to supply. Of course, it doesn't have any. This red line is what's actually left, right? So you can see, and, and basically the curve slows down just because there's not enough supply. You know, so, so only part of the world can meet the supply. And essentially, I mean, this is where we're at. I mean, we're pretty much about out. So this line basically is the deficit. So if we say, how many addresses do we really need versus what we have, this is the growing deficit, right? And you can basically see that it's starting to get significant. That's what's driving CGN or carrier grade net because ISPs have to do it, right? I mean, if, if I'm oversubscribed like four or five to one, I have to, I have to deploy lots of net to survive. That's what's going on right now. Now, one thing that hasn't gotten a lot of press yet, but I'm sure it will, is this unadvertised space. So if you remember, <coughs> question. Yeah, real quick. How much of that growth would you attribute to like, panic ordering of IPs and people hoarding and stuff? Um, that, that's, that's a great question. So I don't, I don't think very much because, um, so the way um, internet governance would really be a whole talk, but, but just to try and give you a brief answer, the way allocation works is if I go and apply for an address to one of the registries, I have to show need. So I can't just go to Aaron and say, you know, I want a slash eight. They're going to be like, okay, well, in order to get a slash eight, you have to do A, B, C, D, and E, and you have to provide documentation. You, ha you, have, to, you have to have a legally incorporated company. You have to show some kind of a business plan. You have to prove that you're actually going to use the addresses. So, so there's actually a lot of background check. You can't just go and get it. So, um, you know, now you can game any system. So, you know, maybe a little, but, but not, not much. I mean, the, the way the system is set up, it's, it's, it's not really an open market. You have to show a need to get it. So I, I don't think there's too much of that. Um, now, uh, the, um, <clears throat> back to what I said about IANA, not all of the space is advertised. So we do have some organizations that basically got IP address space, and they might be using it internally. Like, I can think of a few companies that use public address space internally, but they don't advertise that space on the internet, right? So especially companies that have, that have been around, you know, for 30 plus years. Now, um, if you, we're gonna talk a little bit about the addressing market. If you listen to people that are, wanna sell addresses, they're gonna say, oh, we have a billion addresses left, and there's no IP address crisis, and everything is fine. So what they're talking about is, they're talking about this unadvertised space, right? So, so of course, um, you know, somebody who's trying to sell you something is always going to be a little marketing, right? So a billion is kind of like rounding up a little. Um, actually, there's about 850 million addresses that aren't advertised. Now, it's not that they're not used, right? Somebody, it's kind of like um, if I buy a third car and I store that car in the garage, or you know, maybe I just drive it at a closed racetrack or something. It's not like I don't own the car. I might not drive it on the public roads, but I might still use it. So that's these addresses, they're typically used, but they're just they're not advertised to the internet. Now, what that means is if they're not advertised to the internet, maybe they'd be willing to sell them. And so the, the people in the addressing market, they're basically saying that if you give these people enough money, they're gonna sell you the address space. Now that, that's, that's, that's not really true. Some of these people, like the DOD for example, no matter how much money you offer them, I don't, I don't think they're gonna be interested. <laughs> because that's, you know, they're so big, I mean even if you offer them a billion dollars, I mean to them that's like a rounding error. They'll be able to go away. So, so I guess the question is, and really I, nobody knows the answer, how many of these people would be willing to sell their address space? Because I, I work with a lot of these companies and some of them really, they don't want to. They're not interested, and if I'm like, if I'm a hundred billion dollar company, even if you offer me like 200 million for my address space, you know, I you know, I might like think about it, but if I have to go renumber all my critical stuff all over the world, qu question. Minor point, um, but I thought that it was not uh, permittable under Aaron policy to sell or otherwise market address space. That if an entity were to try yes. to divest themselves of their address space, they'd have to yes. return it to Aaron for allotment. That's, yeah, that, that's a great question. 
and I would love to answer to that. I, I'd be happy to talk about that later, but but that's, it's kind of that 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 is true. But there's of course there's always a way around things. Okay. So Aaron, in the end, in the end, Aaron has to approve it, but but you might but you can pay somebody for the rights, right? So so there could be conditions, but there's you know like I said, there's always a way around. So, so this is kind of the question mark is, how many people are willing to sell that address space? Now some are, there have been a lot of sales this year, a lot of transfers, and uh, what I'm assuming is that's gonna grow, you know, based on what I saw this year, about three slash eights were basically sold and put on the internet. So assuming that grows about 18% a year, that's what the curve looks like. Um, now, um, this shows up to 2020. I, I'm actually curious to see because you know you could probably make IPv4 work forever or, or for a really long time, but how Thank many you. layers of NAT are we willing to put up with? You know, four, five, six, right? Because I mean, if, if, you, if you get up to a trillion devices, it, it starts getting really hard. So I mean, eventually it'll get to the point where some people are like, God, you know, like, you know, even IPv6 is better than this. But when does that happen? Does it happen in one year, two years, three years? I, that's a tough question to answer. So, so this, this is kind of, you can kind of see that in the next five years, it's really going to get tough. Because you, at the end of the day, you still need some public addresses, right? You can't do everything with NAT and privately. So that'll be interesting to see how far it can get stretched. Okay, I, I did, um, i, I got to watch here on time. I did want to talk a little bit about NAT um, and, and, ex, and kind of explain what CGN is. So traditionally with NAT, what most people think of with NAT is kind of like with a home network. Right? So I have like a Linksys or a D-Link or some kind of wireless router at home. Basically that has a public or routable address on the outside interface. And on the inside interface it has a private network, like maybe 192.168.1. something. Right? So when I'm on my laptop or tablet or phone or whatever, I basically <coughs> go through that router, the router does NAT, and everybody sees me as that one address. Right? That's your traditional NAT. Um, so that, that has worked pretty well up until maybe you know, three or four years ago. Um, now, the internet's oversubscribed by about four or five to one, so that's not enough. So now we have what's called carrier grade NAT. So all, all carrier grade NAT is, is it means we have cascading layers of NAT. Um, we, so we have maybe, instead of one NAT device, now we have two or three. So for example, if I'm an ISP and I'm trying to conserve my public IPv4 address space, now I'm going to give you what's called a shared address. So some ISPs will actually use the private address space. Um, like some ISPs have actually forced their customers to renumber because they're saying, you know, we're going to use 10 on the outside, so you can't use it in your internal network, um, which is kind of a pain. So Aaron actually um, set aside uh, 100.64/10 as a special shared address block for for ISPs to use for CGN. So you might see a little of this. So basically, but this is not routable because this is not a unique address. So I will get, instead of getting a public address, I'll get like a semi-private address on my outside interface. And then basically this gets routed somewhere into my ISP's network into some massive router, and this router is then gonna translate into a public address. So that way, instead of my ISP having to give me a public address, maybe it uses one public address for my entire neighborhood. Right, and we, we all sit behind kind of like that giant NAT router. So the nice thing about that, is that it lets the ISP preserve IPv4. And um, you know, in, in, a, in a sense it's positive because it sure beats a broken internet, right? At least the internet continues to function. So that part is good. The bad part about it, um, th th there's a few problems. Um, I'll talk about the problems, well actually, So, so, so there's a few problems, and I, I don't, actually there's, there's more than a few, but, but just kind of high level. So probably one of the biggest problems is security, right? So most people, uh, most sites, if you have somebody that's doing bad things, you're going to blacklist them. You'll say, oh, so-and-so from this IP is causing me problems, I'm going to blacklist that IP. Except now the problem is you just blacklisted a neighborhood or a region, hmm. because that's no longer one user. So, so security becomes more challenging. Um, the, the other thing is communication. So communication, like gaming is the big one. Most people who do, do a CGN, like if you do a lot of gaming and you call up your ISP, they'll, they'll take you off the CGN because it, it just doesn't work well. Um, however, and you know, people say, yeah, but gaming, that's for kids, it's not for me, whatever. But it, it does affect us because anything with voice or video is a problem, right? And SIP is pretty popular. Like 
I don't know how many people use Vonage or something like that. That's it. So if I'm doing if I'm doing point to point voice or video with somebody else, that's communication. That's hard behind uh, CGN. So usually if I'm doing that behind CGN, now I need a third party service. So if I just had that, I would just need a stun service.